Okay, we're looking at section five today. Section five contains two chapters, chapter 24 and 25, both of which are relatively short. Uh, I think 24 is just a couple of pages long. Um, and uh, both of those deal with conditioning. So what is conditioning or the conditioning processes? Uh, these are manufacturing processes which are intended to improve the strength, hardness, or other mechanical properties of a material in order to prepare it for its final intended uh, usage or intended purpose. Um, conditioning is going to alter the internal structure, so the grain structure, the chemical structure, the atomic structure of the material, um, to alter or manipulate or refine its mechanical or physical properties. Okay, um, this, this conditioning processes are usually uh, a secondary process, so there will be a primary process, which may be casting, forging, machining. Um, and so conditioning is done towards the end of the manufacturing, the, the whole manufacturing process for a part um, to prepare it for those that, that last final uh, way. Um, we can break the conditioning processes down into three broad categories, right? We have thermal conditioning processes. This includes annealing, normalizing, hardening, tempering, drying, and firing. All these involve uh, manipulating, altering the thermal environment of the, of the material. Then we have mechanical processes, uh, such as work hardening or shot, shot peening. Um, we've already talked a little bit about um, mechanical conditioning processes, especially work hardening. When we were looking at the forming processes, you'll remember that cold working and hot working um, change the properties of the metal. Um, and so that is kind of getting into what we're talking about with work hardening. So you'll see a lot of similar characteristics there. And then the third conditioning process is, or, or subcategory is uh, chemical processes. And these include catalytic actions and uh, radiation. Um, when we talk about the properties that we're trying to change or alter or manipulate um, in, in a conditioning process, uh, we talk about the, we're looking at the six categories of uh, material properties. So that's elasticity, ductility, strength, toughness, hardness, and then we're going to talk a little bit about moisture content too. We don't usually talk about that with metals, but when you're talking about wood and think about dried lumber um, versus, uh, you know, fresh green lumber versus lumber that has been treated so that it can be outside, like for decking and stuff, though that is lumber that has been altered through a conditioning process and moisture content is certainly going to be controlled or manipulated in, in those environments. Um, we can further break down strength um, to the different types of strength or the different forces that, a, that an object, a material can uh, be exposed to. And these would be tensile strength, compressive strength, shear strength, and torsion strength, right? So we can, we can um, manipulate or strengthen an object uh, against tensile forces um, and and not compressive forces and vice versa. So we remember um, these forces, uh, we can think of them as, uh, or, or think of how the forces act on a body uh, in order to generate these types of uh, forces. So for example, tensile strength um, is uh, a material's ability to withstand being um, pulled apart, okay? That's tensile strength. Tension is when you're trying to pull something apart. Compressive strength is, is uh, strength that works in the opposite direction. So it's strength that opposes compression, okay? Torsion strength is strength um, that opposes twisting. And then shear strength is, is strength that opposes a shearing force or trying to um, basically uh, pull objects apart along shear planes, okay? Uh, so you remember uh, this, this curve, this is the stress-strain curve, and this should be familiar from a couple of chapters ago. 
Um, and when we talk about elasticity, that's the ability of a material to return to its previous shape after a force has been released. So if we have an object like a piece of wood or a piece of plastic or even a piece of metal, you know, aluminum or whatever, um, and we apply a force to it, it's going to bend. And as long as that force is not great enough to actually um, to, to bend the object permanently, when we release that force, the object is going to go back to its original shape. So that's a measure of a of an object or material's elasticity. Okay. And remember that this occurs along this straight part of the stress strain curve, right? This is the elastic region of the curve. After this point right here, the yields, uh, the yield point after this, this is the plastic region where uh, bending things in this region and they don't bend back. Okay. The slope of this line indicates the degree of elasticity of a material. So we can look at an object that has, you know, a, a curve like this. This is going to be basically a plastic material, right? It's not, it doesn't have a lot of elasticity in it. You can see that part is very minimal, but it has a very, uh, you know, uh, elongated plastic region. So that's going to be an object that when or a material when we bend it, it's not going to go back to its original shape, but it can bend for a long time. Okay. Um, if we have an object like this, right, where we have a very almost vertical straight slope, this is this would be a brittle material, right? Because uh, it doesn't bend very much, right? It it right remember strain is a measure of how much basically how much it bends. So you can see that this certainly does not bend as much as the plastic material here, this flexible material. And when we do bend it, as soon as we get to this point right here, what happens? Well, it's going to fracture. It's going to break apart. So that would be a brittle material. And then we can see in between. So elasticity and ductility are kind of the opposite, right? Um, uh, not, not really, but they kind of work in different areas of the stress strain curve. Ductility is the ability of a material to stretch plastically under stress. That is, it's going to bend. It's not going to come back, but it's going to bend without breaking. Okay. Um, the opposite of ductile is brittle. So if you, if, you know, a, a lot of people know and, uh, you know, have a better idea of what a brittle material is. Glass is a bit brittle material. You would not think of bending glass. Okay. Um, so glass is the opposite of a ductile material. Uh, moving into toughness. Okay. Toughness is the ability of a material to absorb energy and plastically deform without fracturing. Okay. So think of a car's bumper, right? We want the, the, the bumper of a car especially the plastic part, to be tough. That is to say, it we can hit it with something, a baseball bat or, you know, a low impact collision with another car, and it's going to absorb that energy, that impact, um, and it's going to rebound and basically come out unscathed so that it's not deformed permanently. All right, that's that's a measure of toughness. So toughness requires a balance of strength, right? We don't want the bumper to be impacted and just uh, bend permanently. And ductility, again, we don't want brittle bumpers. We want them to uh, plastically deform, but not explode in like some brittle glass material, okay? And again, I've provided examples. Many of these are not in your book, okay? so. Um, you might want to keep this in mind, maybe keep this PowerPoint open when you're doing your homework or doing further reading in the book. Um, you know, I, I took these from different, uh, from, from different resources, but this stress strain curve kind of shows an example of, um, very little toughness, right? This blue area, it's not very tough. Why? Because this point right here means that it's fractured, right? So it, it fractures with very little strain, right? And again, remember strain is basically, how much it deforms or, or bends. Okay. So here we can see from zero to this much bending and the material fracture. So an example of this would be like ceramic, like a ceramic cup. You, you don't think of a ceramic cup as being flexible. Um, metals oftentimes have a large degree of toughness and you can see that here. 
um, they fracture here, right? So we get this much strain from here to here, we get this much strain. So this green area is basically a measure of the toughness. And very, very small toughness here, um, we don't get a lot of the ability to withstand stress, right? So that's what this is saying. It's going to bend, but as soon as you apply a stress that's too high, right, a force that's too high, it's going to um, tear apart, all right? So this is very unreinforced polymers. So uh, in, th in this chart, I've, I've just thrown in some examples. Um, these are all metals, um, but this uh, kind of sums up what we were just talking about. A brittle material is going to have a stress strain curve that looks like that, just a straight line, and then it fractures. A ductile material is going to have a more traditional, more typical looking stress strain curve where we have a straight line for the elastic portion, and then we go into the plastic portion here, right? And then it fractures. This would be a ductile material. And then a plastic material is one that is basically just going to continue to bend, right? Um, and, and not return, right? You can see the elastic region is minimal, and then it's going to just bend. And then some common um, metals in here. So we have aluminum. Look at aluminum. Aluminum is kind of looks a lot like a brittle material, right? We have a very high, very steep elastic portion of the curve. And then it as it comes over, it's going to strain and then bend, okay? Um, pure aluminum, right, that doesn't have any... Um, uh, any impurities in it that doesn't have any um, uh, any other uh, uh, any other atoms or uh, materials that are going to uh, make it an alloy uh, is is even is is basically a plastic material, right? Look at that. That's a plastic material, um, and you can see some of the other ones. Um, this is magnesium, mild steel. Molybdenum. Okay. Notice gray cast iron just kind of fractures right there. It doesn't uh, have a, a high degree of strain, right? So that would be a kind of a brittle material, right? It's going to go up here. It's going to bend slightly, right? And then it's going to break. Um, I've put together this chart to kind of give you an idea of um, how each common material uh, behaves uh, in terms of these material properties, elasticity, toughness, brittleness, ductility, malleability, and hardness. Okay, so, um, and, and like I said, many of you are going to have a kind of a, a, a good feeling about this already. Some of these materials, certainly aluminum, you know, we've all held aluminum cans and, and things like that. And so you kind of know that aluminum is not very tough. Um, you know, it's, it's relatively ductile. Uh, look at this. It's hardness is minimal, right? It's not very hard. That makes sense. Tool steel is very hard, extremely hard, right? So it's more elasticity. Look at that. Aluminum alloy is one of the more elastic of the metals. Right, so you are going to be able to bend that a lot without it breaking. Okay, um, and the other ones in here. So this again, this is taken out of this is this is not in your textbook. This is from uh, a whole bunch of other resources. Actually, I put this together from a lot of different resources um, to just help give you a good feeling about where each common material sits on these material property uh, spectrum. So looking at the conditioning processes, why do we do a conditioning process? Well, one, we want to improve formability and machinability. So that means we want to be able to, we, we want to soften it uh, so that we can machine it or form it easier. Okay. Um, that's going to require less energy, less force. Um, you know, it's, it's, it may improve the, um, the, the, uh, the properties of the material. We want to remove the, the second region is we want to reason we want to remove internal stresses that are built up during production processes. You remember 
with casting, um, that we have issues with uh, internal stresses that can be uh, that can be hidden in a cast object. When we cast it, uh, these these stresses get built up in it, and they need to be released, and that can be dangerous, right? Um, and and so we want to relieve those. And one of the ways we can do that is through conditioning processes, typically thermal conditioning processes. Um, and then uh, finally, we want to add a desired mechanical or physical property. So even after we uh, finish doing our primary manufacturing operation, casting, forging, machining, whatever it is, we might want to harden the material or soften the material for that matter um, for its intended final usage. And so those are the three uh, main reasons why we do conditioning processes. Uh, how we do is, is the, the process itself is first we want to establish the, de the desired material properties. What do we want the final product, the final part, the final assembly, what does it need to have in terms of its physical property? Uh, what kind of environment is it going to work in? How long is it going to work? What um, forces, uh, thermal uh, environment is it going to, uh, is it going to be involved in? Um, what happens if it fails? Do we need to protect against failure? How do we protect against failure? So all those things go into step number one. Then that leads to step number two, which is we determine uh, the changes needed to develop the property. So basically, once we say, okay, we need this material to be uh, more ductile, uh, then there's kind of a recipe for how we achieve that uh, improved ductility in that step two. And then finally, step three, we select the process to yield these properties. All right, so what are these thermal conditioning processes? Well, first we have heat treating. OK, uh, heat treating is a thermal conditioning process intended to relieve internal stresses, produce a refined or uniform grain size, change the surface chemistry or strengthen the material. Now, this should be very familiar uh, with you from uh, our our previous uh, section, section four, where we were dealing with for, um, forming operations, specifically uh, hot working and cold working uh, materials where Basically, uh, those processes are heat treating. In addition to forming the, the part, uh, they are also heat treating the material. Um, the heat treating variables, what we have uh, that we can manipulate are the temperature, how high the temperature is or how cold the temperature is. What's the furnace atmosphere, right? Is it just air or do we have something in there like an oil uh, in, in, in oil mist in the environment? Is it a non-reactive um, gas that we, that we put in the, in the atmosphere where the furnace is? Um, what is the rate of temperature change? How quickly do we, not so much heat it up, but more so how quickly do we cool it, right? Do we let it air cool over time, over 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, whatever, or do we quench it and quickly quickly cool it. And then what is the duration of the heating and cooling? And many times this can be a cycling process where we heat it, cool it, heat it, cool it, heat it, cool it to get that uh, desired heat treating or conditioning effect. So now we're going to look at some of the heat treating, some of the more common heat treating processes. So the first one is annealing. Annealing, um, the process is where we heat the material above the recrystallization temperature for a suitable duration and then slowly cool it. And this will soften the material and relieve stresses. And the benefits of this are we have increased ductility, we reduce the hardness, and we improve workability. Hardness and workability kind of work opposite each other, right? Reducing hardness means that a material will be more workable. That is, we can drill a hole in it easier, okay? The annealing process kind of looks like this, okay? So um, this is a typical annealing process for two aluminum alloys. Um, this is this is time on the on the x-axis, and you can think of temperature on the y-axis here. All right, so uh, we're going to ramp up the temperature for one and a half hours to about 400 degrees, 413 degrees Celsius. Then we're going to hold that temperature for an hour. 
And then we're going to slowly cool it down for 5.5 hours, five and a half hours to 260 degrees Celsius. And then we're going to cool it with a fan to the ambient room temperature. So that's a typical annealing process. Okay. Um, and then the conditioning effects for high carbon steel, uh, you know, we can, we can see that here and you want to look at the annealing one. So this is just cold drawn, right? And notice the slope of this line is pretty much straight up, right? So it's, it's kind of a brittle metal. Um, and, uh, and it doesn't, it, it doesn't have a large plastic region. Right. It kind of it fractures right here. All right. Cold rolling will along that a little bit. But when we do stress relief annealing, notice that it changes the curve right here. Right. It's it it decreases this amount, this amount and it kind of pulls this. It stretches this out a bit. And if we do a recrystallization annealing, it, it increases strain uh, allowable strain even further. And spheroidizing annealing, sorry, that's tough to say, um, is another form of annealing. And that will really um, increase the, uh, the amount of strain before we get material failure. Okay, so these, these are high carbon steels um, that we're looking at here. And, and this example is aluminum alloy. So again, not in your book. This is just taken from other resources. Um, normalization is a uh, thermal conditioning processes, process where we heat the steel above its critical temperature, typically about 1500 to 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, so pretty hot, and we hold it for a period of time, and then we air cool it, right? So here, we're heating it up and just holding it at that temperature. Um, this will help to remove impurities and improve strength and hardness. Uh, the benefits are that it's going to relieve, again, relieve internal stresses, all of the heat treating relieves internal stresses. It's going to refine the grain structure and it's going to improve machinability. Hardening is a process by which we heat the alloy above its critical temperature, again of about 15 to 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, then rapidly cool it. All right. So remember the difference here, look at normalization um, and then air cooling it. All right. So much slower. So here we're going to rapidly cool it. The material may be cooled in air or quenched. And sometimes it's even cooled in oil. Right? And if you watch forged in fire, that's the preferred method for, um, for, for hardening a blade. And you'll, you'll remember that if, um, if the judges see a contestant that, uh, water cools, uh, the judges freak out because that's going to be, that's going to create a very uh, brittle blade. Um, the reason why we harden the material is to improve strength and hardness. Hardness is kind of a no brainer, right? We, we improve hardness by hardening. Uh, the benefits are we refine the grain structure. We give maximum hardness and tensile strength and produce minimum ductility, right? So when we harden the material, um, it's, it's going to get hard. That means it's going to get more brittle. Its ductility is going to go down. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, so you kind of have to pick and choose what you're doing. Some other uh, thermal conditioning include austenizing, carburizing, and tempering. Okay. Um, I'll let you read all these, right? We'll, we'll move on to some of the mechanical properties then. Mechanical conditioning processes are applied to a material and it affects its material properties. And these include forming processes. So forging, drawing, bending, etc. All of these are mechanical conditioning processes in addition to shaping the material, shaping the, uh, the, the uh, metal. Uh, these processes cause internal structure of the materials to change. Typically, the material becomes harder and more brittle. All right. Um, this process is called work hardening. It's hardening through working the material. Shop peening is an example of a work hardening process that is not a, um, a, a forming process, right? Shop peening. Um, and shop peening is, is a cold working process because we're 
Um, we're basically shooting, <laughs> shooting uh, uh, or blasting a surface with small particles. They can be glass, metal, ceramic, other materials to cause plastic deformation. Okay, so um, a shot peened object uh, will have, you know, slight dimples in the surface of it. Um, this is a cold working process. Um, and this helps to relieve tensile strength uh, it, or stress. It, imp it increases fatigue life. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's generally for uh, strengthening uh, a material. Here's some examples of shot peening. Right, so you can see that uh, with we're shooting a a material out of it, and what happens? So we are plastically deforming, right? We're de permanently deforming the material, right? Um, and you can see it on the surface right there. What happens to it? It becomes dimpled. The degree of dimpling can be minimal, or it can be you know a, a little bit larger. Obviously. Uh, that has to be factored in to the appearance of the material. Um, but, you know, oftentimes, and in some cases, you know, I've seen it done, done on um, some, uh, you know, where they're working on, um, you know, restoring, uh, let's say, a motorcycle or even building a motorcycle. Sometimes they will do uh, shop peening for the, uh, for the gas tank to give a nice dimpled effect on it. Um, so, you know, a, a, it can have a cosmetic appearance that is desirable uh, in some cases to some people. All right. So that is chapter 24, an overview of the conditioning process. With chapter 25, we're going to get more detailed into that. Um, I also want to remind you that there's a lot of, I'm going to put a lot of really cool videos and I'm also going to put in some extra PowerPoint presentation. There's, there's one that I put together with how to forge uh, a, a sword. Uh, and now that we've um, had uh, chapters and um, lectures on the forging process and now conditioning, uh, this is a perfect opportunity for you to look at that uh, PowerPoint and, and kind of see the whole process, how a sword is made from start to finish and how it includes a, a forging process and a conditioning process. All right, so I'll see you in the next video.